Welcome back, everybody. This is John Malanka with the United Patients Group, Be Informed and Be Well. This topic today and our special guest, um, this topic comes up for some reason, Chelsea, it's, it's, a, it's a taboo topic. And I don't know why people are always shy to talk about it, but it's um, how can I, this one comes in all the time. How can I improve my sex life physically, emotionally, and spiritually? Um, and we have an expert today speaking on this exact topic, Chelsea Sabara. How are you doing, Chelsea? Hi, John. I'm doing absolutely great. Thank you for having me. Um, I am a, a real evangelist for cannabis's ability to enhance uh, all of those dimensions that you mentioned. Uh, and um, particularly, it has a unique power, I think, to address that stigma and that shame, that internal shame that does make it hard to talk about uh, because of its own stigmatized nature. So I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit. But um, but yeah, it's it's my favorite thing in the world to discuss. So very happy to be here. Well, I, it, this is a first for uh, this topic on the United Patients Group talking in this in this in this uh i guess publicly we've written articles on it but not publicly spoke about this but it always comes in so let me um read your impressive uh bio first off <laughs> and uh, we'll go from there so chelsea sabara uh, she's been helping humans effectively and mindfully combine sex and cannabis since 2010 as a professional sex educator product developer and medically certified cannabis consultant she is proud to have de uh, developed the first water-based Barrier uh, compatible THC lubricant, Velvet Swing, which we'll talk about that. Ms. Sabara has been featured in numerous publications such as Forbes, Cosmopolitan, and Dope Magazine. Uh, was named one of uh, Medical Marijuana's Ventures Top 40 Under 40 in 2008, and has been featured uh, speaker at the prominent industry conference such as Women Grow, which we've spoken at. Uh, she recently uh, founded Sabara Consulting and continues to teach her high demand sex and cannabis workshops and speaks nationally on the intersection of cannabis with sex, kink, and uh, consent culture, which is really important. So uh, welcome, welcome, Chelsea. Um, so this one comes up, you know, how can I make sex better for me? I have a lot of friends that we were talking pr before we uh, uh, got on camera here. You know, I had an incredible relationship with my wife. And uh, for our viewers, I think everyone has known, you know, um, uh, Corinne passed away from pancreatic cancer, but that was something with communication. Um, you know, we had that in, in, in all forms of our life. And a friend of mine who's been married for 25, 26 years, I've actually quite a few of my friends, their relationship is just a husband and wife, but no more so as roommates right now. And, and it, it's really important to have that. Uh, and I remind them all the time after especially losing my wife to remind my friends, have these conversations, you know, with, with, with your spouse, with your partner. It's so important. And so, um, you know, can you talk about forging this connection, not only um, with eye gazing, communication, breathing, touching, holding, but why would someone use, uh, want to use cannabis to enhance sex? And uh, what does it actually do? Because this topic comes in from <laughs> the, 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 I'll say youth, but the young adults who call us up to the 80, 90 year olds when we speak at retirement communities. Mm -hmm. Does this work for this? And so can you talk about that please? Yeah, yeah. well both cannabis and sex tend to occupy this uh, demographic free zone, right? It yeah. does not follow the rules uh, and everyone at every level of life, at every intersection uh, is interested in, in some capacity, right? Uh, and so this this is actually a really great lead into what I like to say about the uh, the dual stigmatization of cannabis and sexuality that unfortunately uh, both exists in our Western American culture right now. The way that the stigma has developed is slightly different, but the way that stigma operates psychologically is very similar, and. In this case, the, the thing that cannabis can do, especially now when it's really coming to the forefront of the national conversation, is it can open the door to a conversation about sexuality. Because if you are going to talk to your partner about, if you're going to add, if you're considering adding cannabis to partnered sex, you're going to have to talk to your partner about it, right? Partner or partners. Uh, to not do that is a consent violation. And we'll go over a little bit of how to best uh, deal with the unique consent challenges that intoxicants and cannabis in particular 
may pose. However, we're going to take it as a matter of, uh, we're going to assume that you are a good person and that you do not intend to dose anyone and you're going to bring this up as something that you're interested in. That takes bravery, but it also is an opportunity to be more intentional about the other elements of your sexuality. One of the things that I encourage people to do um, generally, just generally, but definitely if you're considering any kind of intoxicated sexual connection or even a non-intoxicating topical cannabis preparation is to sit down with your partner and do what, a, what is called a yes, no, maybe list. And this is a really fun exercise. It can be goofy. You can laugh through it. It's, it's just, it's, it's kind of tends to be more lighthearted, but it's really important to get the information, whether you've been sexually active with your partner for a day or for 10 years. Uh, the information is, is, probably going to be new and it's going to be interesting. So these exist online. You can go online and you can just download a template or you can make your own. And basically you're listing every possible sexual activity that you can think of from masturbation to necrophilia. Like you're listing everything that you can possibly think of that people might do. And then you're going to say whether this is something you're always into, a yes, something that you could be into or you're interested in under the, the right circumstances, which is a maybe, or something you're absolutely never going to do, right? And uh, I think we can imagine what goes in that column. But the, the, uh, and then you can also distinguish between, you know, a fantasy of a thing, right, or the actual doing of it. So you have a fantasy of a threesome maybe, but you don't really want to have a threesome, right? That kind of stuff. This exercise is a hoot. It gets a lot of the weird feelings out and it has the the ability of outsourcing responsibility for posing the question so you don't have to say hey i'm curious about bondage you can just say bondage is on the list how do you feel about that somebody else put it there you didn't put it there so you might say <laughs> you know <laughs> so when in doubt blame someone else right this works. This is something that I use yeah. for my toddler, actually. You know, I'm not waking you up. The alarm is waking you up. How funny. You're right, but, mom. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it, it works uh, in, in stigmatized topics of all kinds because you're not the impetus. You don't have to take ownership over being that there. And that helps you feel more comfortable. And it might also make your partner feel more comfortable. So right. then you can just say how you feel about that. Um, so this is something that's just really cool to do in general, and especially if you're, you're going to consider intoxicated sex or uh, even a, a topical, as I said. And the other part of your question that you, you asked is, why? Why would somebody do that? Cannabis is, and I, am not, I don't feel like it's hyperbolic to say this, a revolutionary sexual aid, uh, particularly for people with vulvas. Um, but however, people with penises as well also works great for them. The reason that it can be so effective at enhancing sexual response, uh, and I do want to put a blanket disclaimer, I'm sure you have one for the show over this, nothing I'm saying is medical advice, this is all personal opinion uh, and anecdote, I have to say, um, but but I, I do I do throw those disclaimers out there. Okay, so, cool, good, good. This, good. Is, this is not this is for education informational purposes only. Right. Um, this is not replace a one on one with your with your counselor, your psychologist, mm -hmm. or your doctor. Yeah. Um, and so, perfect. Chelsea yeah. Subaru, please. Little <laughs> little CYA there. Yeah. Yeah. There you uh, go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So so yeah the 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 reason uh, that I believe and we we don't have really fully developed research on this um, because of that dual stigmatization, you're, you're t talking about, you know, not only are you researching cannabis, but you're researching sex and cannabis. No way. You're not going to get the funding for that. You're going to have a hard time getting it past uh, IRB. So what we know is cobbled together from other studies. And we know that cannabis is what's called a peripheral vasodilator, which just means that it enhances blood flow at the periphery in the smallest blood vessels in your body, the capillaries at the end of, you know, your fingertips and things like that. The reason that this is relevant sexually is because uh, that dense vasculature that happens in the genitals and the uh, key role, the major role that blood flow 
plays in sexual response. So obviously people are thinking of erectile tissue and the way that blood flow uh, causes rigidity there. But I'm actually talking about pulling, it's pulled back from that a little bit. We're not talking Viagra here. This is about sensitivity and it mimics the body's natural arousal response in a way that doesn't feel foreign. It doesn't feel like a warming lube or something, which is always weird. I like, this is, you know, a strange sensation. This is a very natural sensation. And that kind of creates, although cannabis itself is not an aphrodisiac most of the time, what it kind of creates is this feedback loop. So your body begins responding, your brain gets on board, that in, in turn, well, that, that's right. a huge part that people come, come to us uh, uh, a lot of times, you know, the power of intention. So you're talking about intentions mm -hmm. and one, I want to go back to your consent. So I thank you for putting that in. And I know that's, that's, that, that is uh, uh, very important. You know, you don't want to have the, uh, the date rate drugs that you're hearing about and people automatically put everything in the same basket. And so thank you for pointing that out. But back to the brain portion, you know, it's, it is pr pretty much <laughs> the biggest sex organ in our body. It is. And, uh, but the heart is the machine that drives it. And so we have a lot of patients, uh, actually patients, people that, that call us and say, help, you know, about dysfunction. And so can you talk about that? You, I knew you were going there, but, uh, yeah. you know, of, of bringing two people together and one may have, one may have uh, dysfunction and, and uh, need, need uh, a, 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 an extra Push, push, boost, boost, that's <laughs> yeah, the word sorry, I'm looking for. So, yeah, thanks. certainly. Um, uh, cannabis can help with sexual, sexual dysfunction pretty broadly because a lot of the things that it does happen to address causes of sexual dysfunction. And so I'm going to name some specific things that people often will use cannabis for. Mm -hmm. um, if you are someone with a vulva, uh, common, common concerns is pain with penetration, um, uncomfortable tension, vas vaginismus, um, you can have uh, PTSD or uh, traumatic res response to um, being touched. Uh, and that sort of thing is more in the brain than in the body. Mm -hmm. But cannabis ability to decrease anxiety and relax is often helpful with that. I want to uh, quickly note here that there's a topical application and there's the systemic inhaled or edible application. And these are going to be appropriate for different uses here. Um, but there's also just uh, difficulty getting things going, right? You might be mentally on board, but your body's not responding. And we see this a lot in uh, peri or postmenopausal people, or also those who have undergone chemo, which may be particularly relevant. There's some sexual changes that are common uh, during and after chemo. And um, the ability of cannabis to kickstart that physiological response, I think, is very useful. Um, many cannabinoids, if not all cannabinoids, are anti-inflammatory and therefore uh, can decrease the kind of micro tears that can happen with you know, even gentle penetrative sex. So uh, we have a decrease in pelvic muscular tension, pelvic floor tension that can be the result of unconscious tightening from trauma. Uh, we have a decrease in inflammation. We have increased blood flow, increased lubrication as a result of that blood flow, decreased anxiety anxiety. And if you are someone who has a penis, then you may find that it enhances your ability to become erect. Now, again, I want to really stop short of saying Viagra because there's a lot of bad marketing out there that says it's an herbal Viagra and blah, 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 but it's not. <laughs> I just want to put a full stop to that. That's not the degree we're talking here. But all of the structures in vaginas and also, you know, what we would traditionally call female anatomy, though I try very hard not to use that term. Um, it's all analogous, right? Um, so the clitoris is the glands of the penis. There's it's the same tissue. It just develops differently from the time that you're an embryo. So everything that works for a person with a vulva is going to also work for a person with a penis, but the application will be a little different. The dosage is a little different and you can expect somewhat more muted results in my experience. Typically people with vulvas get a hundred percent of the, of the, the, the um, effects uh, a person with a penis might expect 70 to 80% of that.
Gotcha. Well, well, well put there. The, you mentioned anxiety. Um, mm-hmm. the, we're in the, the world right now. Where, I mean, everybody, not just here in America, but, but globally, everyone's under stress, anxiety, depression, uh, daily stress from work, from, from uh, not being able to see families touch, touching. I feel, I mean, will dating be, be ever be the same? I hope not. I mean, I mean, really, I mean, yeah, okay. Because I mean, it wasn't going so great. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> uh, you know, but I mean, when do you see yourself going out to anywhere nowadays? I mean, that, that's a thing. And so, you know, um, I think cannabis, when, when it, for stress, anxiety, depression, daily stress, it helps relieve that and lo- lower it. And so um, a lot of couples that I, that I talk to bring it into the relationship for gentle touch, massage, the connection between the partners, because a lot of partners in the, when I was mentioning earlier about my friends, I mean, I have friends that have been married and they haven't made love in over six, seven months. And I said, mm-hmm. how is that possible guys? You know, and they said, we're just busy. And I said, make time, make time. And so, um, can you talk about sparking up a relationship? But again, mm-hmm. having these conversations, that checklist was, was great. And I think a lot of people don't want to talk it. They just want to have normal missionary sex. I, I, I might challenge you on that. I don't think they want to. I think they have done a cost benefit analysis and the risk is too scary to. Uh, okay. Okay. But I, and but I think that checklist that you're talking about, yeah. they have a, they, they communicate with each other, brings them to a different level. They can laugh. They can say, yeah. hell no. Yeah. <laughs> you know? um, and so can you talk about that? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. The, the, the conversation starting, I think is, what, not only one of the things that cannabis is well suited for, but also the hardest part of a lot of these things. Um, one of my uh, uh, colleagues, Reed Micalo, has this this way of like, if you are somebody who's not naturally at ease with sexuality, uh, one of the ways that he would recommend to bring up a uh, maybe a scary topic is, uh, I have an idea, or I had an idea, right? But while there's all these different ways that you can, once you've decided that you want to bring something up, uh, that you can help make it easier to do. And I promise once you get started having the conversation, it's already so much easier. Starting it is the hardest part and finding the the right place to start is the hardest part. Hell, even, uh, you know, if you both like to consume together, having a very light amount uh, that you share uh, of cannabis uh, and then in order to be in the right headspace to have the conversation and to feel less inhibited can be an excellent choice if that's something that is pre-existing in your relationship and normal in your relationship. Probably don't start off that way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but um, the, re- the question behind the question and what's going on with your friends and even me, well, I'm like one of the horniest people that you're going to meet. And I'm struggling with my libido in this, in this context. Um, everybody is struggling in this really weird context where we're around each other kind of a lot, but the interest and in the, the dynamism can feel muted or we can feel out of touch with, uh, with that. So the first step on this is you have to want to have that conversation. You have to want it badly enough to do it, whatever that is, you know, whatever that line is for you where you're over the hump, pun intended, I guess, uh, to, to bring up the, the topic with your partner. And that is just a matter of saying to yourself, sexual fulfillment is, normal, is a normal thing to desire. It's a natural thing to desire. I am not weird or bad. I shouldn't feel ashamed. My fantasies aren't strange. I guarantee you guys, your, your fantasies are not strange. I've seen a lot of fantasies and let me tell you, pretty much whatever you're thinking is pretty normal. <laughs> Um, (laughs) even if you think you're really weird, I promise you're not that weird. So the, the getting over that, that sense of it not being important or not important enough to bring up or not important to bring up right now under these circumstances, I would say it's very important. And there is a whole new side of yourself, a whole new world of fulfillment that exists just on the other side of that gate of shame and uh, inhibition where you're doing something that is 
completely okay to do and also profoundly satisfying. So you, you just have to make that call that this is important and that's okay. It, it, it is okay. What, what is the history about this? Because a lot of other topics, we you know, it goes back to the history of where, how cannabis was brought into, uh, it's been around for thousands of years, thousands mm-hmm. of years. And so do you have any history of, of uh, uh, cannabis and sex? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, it's it's pretty it's pretty intricate, and the stigma that is attached to sexuality reaches back pretty far, but not in a uniform way across all cultures. So, it is in some ways difficult to get hard proof of what's uh, how it has been used. Yeah. But I'll tell you one thing: any time human beings have found a mind-altering substance the next thing they did was apply it to sex. Guaranteed, that happened right away. Um, So the the chances that the intoxicating effects of cannabis were discovered and that, uh, you know, between three and five days later is probably the first time it was used to enhance sex um, is uh, is very slim. I mean, that's, that's what we do as human beings. Now, in terms of actual evidence that we have that cannabis is being used. Um, We've got starting in ancient Egypt, um, some recent, actually here, let me pull it up. I happen to have it here. Uh, So you have about 4,000 years ago in um, ancient Mesopotamia and Egypt, you have gynecological use of uh, cannabinoids. And these are often in childbirth. It's actually used to help the pain of childbirth uh, for a very, very, uh, very long time. Anything that is Kind of spastic pain, it, it seems to show up as a, an, a treatment for. You have the um, the use through Africa. Uh, there's there's uh, some evidence there that it was used. Oh, hold on, I got to bring up my screen again here. <laughs> um, there was some evidence that it was used there uh, topically, and we can talk about the the effects of. Uh, whether we're talking about a medical use or a uh, a sexual enhancement use, and that line gets really blurry, right? Um, using it for cramps, and uh, which we might solidly consider in the medical side of things, yeah. or using it to address issues of physical sexual response or dysfunction happening. Um, you know, at what point are we? Are we in that, you know, one or the other? And I kind of feel like it's almost guaranteed that the pleasure enhancing effects yeah. um, were, were taking place alongside of yeah. these medical effects, right? And they um, use it, I, I think one of, the, one of the queens throughout history use it for, for menstrual cramps. Yes, yeah. And we have, uh, there's the, um, uh, the Nordic... Uh, princess, what was her what was her name? She died of breast cancer in her early twenties. The Ice Maiden, the Siberian Ice yeah. Maiden. Yeah, yeah. So she was found with cannabis, which was almost certainly used to relieve her pain uh, from that that disease. And um, what we uh, what we see, oh, also in uh, Europe, the the concoction that witches. This is timely, considering that it's October. The concoction that witches were said to rub on their broomsticks, which may have been a real thing, actually, as it turns out, maybe not as developed as it was with witches and things like that. But using a broomstick as an applicator for topicals actually seems to be something that that happened. So. Um, and that's where the, the myth comes from. But well, What's that story? So I'm trying to envision <laughs> as, as, you, as she's riding this broom and I'm like, okay, topical. So is it, put it here. <laughs> long, <laughs> how, um, how are you that? <laughs> well, it's, it, it, allegedly there was this ointment that would be placed on the broomstick and witches would rub their vulvas on it. And oh, that was their adapter or they were like, what, what, what they would sit on it. And, and they would sit on it. Yeah. And that, that that's was, supposed I'm, I'm a visual person. I was like, okay, where's she going with it? Well, well, I'm going to decline to demonstrate, but, okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, but yeah, the, um, the, that app, that was, that kind of developed into this idea that witches use this ointment to fly right okay. on their brooms, yeah. but there's some evidence that 
this method may have been used to, uh, there may be various psychoactives in there and cannabis was likely part of the preparation uh, of some of these. And that can be used to, you know, everything again, from just relieving menstrual cramps to enhancing sexual response. And then uh, of course, as we know, in the uh, turn of the last century, we had a real proliferation of cannabis uh, tinctures mm -hmm. and various kinds of preparations. They're really ubiquitous at that, at that time. And so those, those I'm certain also, you know, to get used. You, you were talking enhancements and we spoke about cannabinoids earlier. And I always, in, on, on my show, I always talk about, um, there's about 140 cannabinoids. I've heard anything from 113 to 160 and above. Where, where do you yeah. fall in that? Oh, gosh. Um, well, I think that the the number of them is interesting. I've, yeah. I've heard everything from 86 to like 200. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, but what I found really interesting about it is that most of them are analogous in some way. So what we're really interested in are those cannabinoids that have some kind of unique action that uh, is, is set them apart from yeah. a lot of their, their cohorts. Uh, and we do see that with a number of different cannabinoids. Now, with regard to sexuality, this is an area that's deeply uh, under-researched, right? Like we can postulate based on other research what these things might do for sexuality, but we badly need that actual study. And I'm, I'm trying to get it done. I'm in the, in the process. Of well, there's, there's quite it. a few, you know, you've, you've worked with uh, um, a couple in the uh, others in the industry that I, that I uh, have known for years as well. And so I, uh, who one being a doctor, oh, Dr. Tishler, you know, Lo you, love him. Yeah. You've been on a, on a board with him. He's been on the show as well too. And so since there's a big CBD boom right now, everyone thinks CBD, 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 which is good and bad because there's, I don't want people to be afraid of THC. And that's, that's the thing that, uh, that, uh, that your little toddler, are you going to bring him? I was looking for my glass of water, which I left in the, oh. other. we're good. Thank you. Thank I'll you. Share with you. Much appreciate it. <laughs> it's wet. Show off. Um, so with the boom of CBD, of course, I don't want people to be afraid of THC. And so does CBD um, work as well as, as THC does for sexual enha enhancement? Uh, short answer, no. Okay. Long answer, strap in. Here's a long answer because Bring I have on. feelings about this. Uh, so, so it's really unfortunate that CBD has come to dominate the cannabinoid uh, marketplace the way that it has. And the yeah. reason for that is really appropriate to the topic that we're discussing uh, because CBD is what I call a promiscuous cannabinoid, meaning it has weak action at a large number of receptor sites. It is slutty and it's out there doing one night stands with these receptors, right? So uh, because of that weak action, it is one of the worst cannabinoids to use in isolation. And what do we have in our current marketplace? Exactly that, the, the dominance of isolated CBD yeah. products. The only way to overcome that weak action in a CBD product in order to make it effective is to crank the dosage very, very high. And that comes with its own set of side effects. And CBD uh, is not harmless. Uh, just because it is not psychoactive, it actually has a number of drug interactions that people should really be wary of. If you're at, taking low doses, probably not something to worry about. But if you are taking these high medically active doses, it's contraindicated with every drug that grapefruit juice is. Yeah. So if you wouldn't, you know, right? Uh, so if you wouldn't have grapefruit juice with a medication, you shouldn't be taking high doses of CBD with it either. This includes Viagra, relevant to my own work. Uh, so you would want to avoid taking high doses of CBD with Viagra. CBD is a great cannabinoid. I do not dislike CBD. The problem is that it really shouldn't be used alone. THC is really your powerhouse when it comes to the sexual, sexuality, sex enhancing 
effects of mm -hmm. cannabis, the things that people are going for, that enhanced blood flow, sensitivity, and enhanced, actually, I forgot to mention this earlier, but it's kind of one of the coolest parts, uh, enhanced orgasmic response. So you are more likely to have an orgasm. That orgasm is like more likely to be stronger. And if you are someone who is potentially multiply orgasmic, you are more likely to have that effect as a result of using cannabis as well. So all of these things come primarily from THC, from what we know, although CBD plays a very important helper role. And it can, if present in a significant quantity, it can help with a lot of what we would consider those dysfunction things. A lot of people use it for that tension. It's really helpful topically for inflammation. Uh, all of these, these kind of supporting uh, activities. So THC is maybe the uh, gas in your car there and uh, CBD is going to be, I don't know, the oil or something like that, well, right? Well, but, you know, thank you, thank you for that. I'm enjoy enjoying this conversation. And I'm, I'm thinking of all the calls that we've had over the years with people giving us, giving us calls and asking, you know, I always do, I present at, at conferences, both in the cannabis sector as well as out. And <clears throat> people who've watched our show have heard me talk about this, but I'll put a slide of a roll of duct tape on there. And people will look at me in the audience and look at the slide like, hey, you have the wrong slide up there. And I always say, I was chuckling. I said, actually, I don't want to say cannabis is like, has, is, it has a million and one uses like duct tape, but when you really <laughs> get down to it, it does. I mean, it has so yeah. many benefits and even having this, this, this talk about cannabis and sex and, and spirituality and, and, and communication, you know, a lot, a lot of the couples that, that I speak to on a regular basis, you set, use sex to escape, you use sex, you know, it, it, it's a, uh, an escape rather than a journey. They want to get away from their daily lifestyle. And I think this is something that, that can bring them closer together and, and forget about what, what's going on in life for, five, 10, 15 minutes, two hours, three hours, however they want to be intimate with each other. Um, you know, and with that topic as well, it always comes in to the cannabis naive that I don't want to try this because of paranoia mm -hmm. and I don't want, you know, and so what do you share? What can you share with, with the, the listeners that are, that may have that of paranoia that, uh, we've all been paranoid on cannabis, you yeah. know, and nothing worse than, you know, you, you don't want to be in an intimate relationship with your partner and be paranoid, you know, and not look in each other's eyes and yeah. minds thinking going a million miles over here while your partner's thinking this, this. And so what can you share about that? Yeah, I think that Dr. Tischler would, uh, would really chime in there too okay. when it, with regard to dosage. Uh, he's a huge yeah. advocate of dosage regulation, especially for people who are new, uh, which is the general rule is always start slow, start low, go slow. Uh, but the, the idea that you may need very, very small dosages to achieve your effect and that a little bit enhances, but a lot is going to hurt the experience. Yeah. I think that um, the, I think I want to bring it back around a little bit to the consent thing Please. here as well, because the concerns with cannabis and consent violations are linked directly to overdoing it, basically, right? I, there are some people, especially back in the 90s, they used to say, oh, never, never play high. You know, it's not a good idea to, mm. or, and even now some people will say, if you are intoxicated at all, that your consent is rendered invalid. And I think that that's not only wrong, but I think it's harmful and that it uh, takes the agency away from people, especially women. So if you are a little bit intoxicated, if you've had a glass of wine or if you've had a puff on a joint, I don't think that your consent is rendered invalid. But we need to stop thinking about consent as a black or white thing, given or not given. Uh, consent is a gradient. And anytime that we engage in a sexual, a partnered sexual activity, you are accepting some level of risk of a consent violation. And in some cases that amount of risk may be vanishingly small. Uh, 
Uh, but you were always doing that. And the more factors you add in, like intoxication, degree of intoxication, uh, familiarity with your partner, although partnered sex is one of the places that consent violations will often happen and not be addressed or discussed meaningfully. So we do need to note that that is a common place and not okay occurrence. But the, there are all these different things that come in and they all kind of add up to your own risk analysis. With cannabis, people who are new, especially to, to it, will often want to try an edible. And that's a really- Can I back up on this? Yeah, topic? Sure. Back up, rewind 30 seconds here. Yeah. What about having a safety word? You know, because, you know, and, and that you can write down in your outline, your, your box, your checks, the, the, the boxes that you're mm -hmm. checking. And but talking about consent, because this is a big topic. I mean, now things oh, are, yeah. all, it's huge. You know, happened 20, 30 years ago. You're in court. You're seeing what's happening, you know, to, to a lot of these, uh, I don't want to say celebrities, but, uh, you know, in the, in the, in the, in Hollywood, you know, mm -hmm. you, I mean, clearly it's, it's, it's made its way around the globe because of what's going on, but have, back to one-on-one -on -one with, with your partner, with your, uh, with your partner, your spouse, yeah. whatever. Uh, yeah, if you want to talk you, about, yeah, absolutely. Talk, uh, talk, sorry, just some basic, uh, basic consent practices that are good to do for any kind of yeah. sexual encounter uh, are, uh, I, I can go through some of those really quick. And then just imagine increasing the importance of doing this if you are in an intoxicated situation or you're planning an intoxicated situation. The, the, I often say the antidote to risk is intentionality. So any amount of, you're always taking on risk, but the only way that you can decrease that is to set out to only do what you're going to do on purpose, you know? And if you're doing that yes, no, maybe list, don't take anything from the maybe column if you're high, you know, keep it in the yes column, right? Uh, try to, try to, to make sure that the person that you are with is someone uh, who you understand and have some kind of set of nonverbal uh, communications. Beyond that, safe words are great. It is wonderful to have a safe word, something that you can do when you have reached the not okay point. But ideally, you want there to be a lot of levels before you get to not okay. You want a lot of different ways to redirect what's going on before you hit not okay. And you can do that through nonverbal, uh, simple, you know, ways to redirect your partner's body. You can do it through hand squeezes. Uh, in the kink world, there is, you know, very real and frequent situation where you can't talk. So what are you going to do? Maybe you can use hand signals. One means yes, two means no, squeezes, something like that. The person you are with is also then under a greater burden of responsibility to check in with you more frequently. Consent is a two-way process. And people say uh, how dry it must be to, to engage with, uh, with consent practices. So they're picturing a sexual interaction where somebody I, 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 yeah. is it so okay I like to check the, the, the checking in thing i mean it makes sense people Are, think of that as a as a as an unsexy process yeah. and i want to deeply challenge that notion yeah. because every time it, stop thinking of it as a consent check-in but think of it as dirty talk okay okay so every time uh how blue can i get on this podcast <laughs> Bring it on. <laughs> we're going to, so, you know, we're going to open some eyes and ears and you know, I, I don't want people to be shy about this. I'm holding back. You know, holding back. And there's, no, and even though I live in this world, I blush very easily. Yeah, so do I. I thank you, know? you Celtic so, uh, um, background. So I'm, um, I'm glad you said that because, uh, you know, I'm, I'm right there and you know, there are a couple of questions that I've held back and like, maybe you'll see this on the playback of like, no, I can't go there. But you know, <laughs> well, I always so try to keep on. it. This is what this is about. I want it. I want it to be free talking. You were talking about. I wasn't thinking about not being not being able to talk because of the kink thing. Yeah. So if somebody has a okay, that's, that, yeah. that's you know. So go on. 
But kinksters really lead the way in this, this, this way, because if you're going to do something that's more risky as power play is, right, you had better be more intentional with it. And so the code, the yes, no, maybe list, that comes from the kink community. This, is, the, this codification of consent practices really comes from those who are operating at the fringes and have a deep incentive to make sure that what they're doing is consensual. So when it comes to a consent check-in, if you're somebody that wants to check in, don't think of it as asking permission. Think of it as saying what you want to do. I want to slam you up against this wall and fuck you till you're sore. How, what would you, you like that? You can't say that on my show. I can't? <laughs> no, you can't. <laughs> so if you're going to say that, yeah. just follow it up with, would you like that? Or you, you'd like that, wouldn't you? That is a consent inquiry. It's hot and it's a consent inquiry, right? Yeah. This is what I try to, try to get home to people is it's, it, this is not a dry process. That this is not a sterile process. This is a process of making sex better by making sure in as many ways as possible that your partner is really, really into it. And that only has the, the effect of improving sex. It doesn't stop the action. It heightens it. It heightens it. I think it, it, it's setting the mood, you know, again, having that communication, but again, use this as another, another uh, boost in, in your relationship or what, what's about to happen. I'm a fan of massage and I think starting mm -hmm. out um, that breaks the ice as well. Um, mm -hmm. Is this too hard? Is this too soft? Do you like your feet being rough? Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I think including that and, 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 uh, Having this one-on-one -on -one experience of, I mean, who doesn't like the one, two, three, wham, bam, you know, but it's, uh, there's times, there's times where you can have that and there's times you can have the long, mm -hmm. uh, even you, I'm, I'm even uh, being a little, uh, it's okay. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. um, but that's what this is for. I mean, I, I, I receive these, these, I'm certain you receive these questions daily. I receive these questions all the time too. And so that's why I wanted to have you on the show. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's funny. I, I grew up overseas, grew up here in the States and then we were transferred overseas and we came back. And I talk about this with my friends that I grew up with overseas because we missed a whole sex education classes mm -hmm. here in the States. We were over there. We were overseas. Uh, we you didn't miss back. much. And, what's that? You didn't miss much. <laughs> well, well, we didn't even have, I mean, yeah. I, I always ask them, it's like, did you have that talk? Said, no, we never, we completely missed it. Completely missed it. So this wasn't a talk I had with my parents where mm -hmm. nowadays my friend's kids are open smoking a joint with their parents or having the sex talk with their parents, which I think is very, very, very healthy. You know, it shares with them of what's right, what's wrong, safety. Um, you know, times have changed. I mean, times have changed. And so, um, so that's why I, we ha I, I, love, I'm, I was excited to have this conversation with you, this topic at least uh, to come on. Um, so I cut you off. We were going to the massage, the mode, the mood. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, I wanted to make a quick note. Uh, yeah. as, as a woman, uh, there is a, a kind of a gendered way that this plays out. And a lot of uh, men, I think, are not as aware of it. And so I like to, I like to talk about it where I can, that there's uh, this strange tension where it's, it's difficult for a lot of women who are socialized a lot to, to not be forthright about our sexual desires. And if we are forthright, oftentimes we'll receive negative feedback from that. So creating a safe container for someone who walks through the world as female and is received as female uh, is, is a really important thing and a, a, a burden that, that falls on uh, ma male partners, if you're in a heterosexual relationship, to to not just say the words, it's okay to tell me whatever you might want to do, but to live that and make sure that it really is okay and also find opportunities to invite her, not into your fantasies, but for for you to be invited into hers. Most people being heterosexual, you know, I'm speaking in, in generalities here, but it's it's something that I think does come out at a, at a systemic level that it's, it's not enough just to say yes or no. It's not enough just to say, well, I told you it's okay. 
to say whatever you want. You know, you have to, you have to make it okay. And you have to be a safe person in and out of the bedroom. Right. And, uh, and that's bigger work, just like everything else. Sexuality is a microcosm of the bigger work. Right. It is. And I, and coming from an incredible relationship, I think trust is really important. Oh yeah. Trust is really important. And, uh, so, you know, uh, that, that's it's funny that's where my vision is with this uh, um where it was and then that's why when you threw the kink in i'm like oh i wasn't even thinking about uh you know that topic there uh, but trust is important you know inside and outside the, of, of of the bedroom and house work everything and i think that's what brings partners together um you know it it's uh you know i had a great marriage and so i'm i'm not out there yet uh, and so I'm still picturing, you know, uh, one-on-one. Um, and so, yeah, but, you know, communication and trust mm-hmm. is really, really important. And I know it's a, it's a topic, you know, men, I said, most men think differently than women, you know? And so you were talking about, no, I'll tell you what my fantasies are, meaning a woman sharing, sharing the fantasies mm-hmm. uh, with their man, with, with the man. Um, I, I think yeah. Dan Savage has some really great, advice on this. He gets a lot of letters from guys that are wondering what they can do to enhance their wife's libido. They have a mismatch and he's got a higher sex drive than she does. Dan's response is, think about what her day is. When's the last time you did the dishes? When's the last time you got the kids out the door? When's the last time? It's not that she's not interested most of the time. It's that she's tired because women bear a much a very unfair proportion of household and emotional labor in, in, in heterosexual partnerships. So if she's doing 80% of the work to maintain the house. And then at the end of the day, you want her to flip the switch and be a sex goddess. Good luck, right? You need to think about things from her perspective and think about her history and think about everything else that has gone into getting her where she is today and really be sensitive to that. And uh, yeah, Dan Savage is, you know, Start with doing your part around the house and see if magically her. You know, those are the conversations I'm having with my friends. The husband's yeah. saying one thing, the wife's saying, oh, really? Okay, <laughs> let's go down this list here. I'm getting up, getting our child ready, you know, for school. Now the school is 24 7 at home because they're not at school. Mm-hmm. She's working, she's shopping, she's cleaning. She comes home, she's making dinner. She's putting the child, you know, giving the child a bath, reading a book, saying their prayers, whatever. <laughs> so I think for anybody, your day is just like this. I'm done. Yeah. And so, you know, the man sitting there, like y- y- you see, and you've seen in every movie, show, book, cartoon, we're ready to go. It's like, really? Let's back up there. That's why I think massage is really important. Mm-hmm. Touch is important. Um, uh, you know, be, to get on that same level. Um, I always say, get away. You know, that's one thing Chris and I always talk about. Date night. It's so important to have a date night. I don't care how busy you are. Whatever it is, go do a date night. We'd be so slammed at work. I would get, we would go to the restaurant. We'd go in at five and be out of there by 530 sometimes, you know, mm-hmm. just because we were, but I would put on our phone, I'd put a picture of Italy or a beach and I'd put it next to the salt and pepper shaker and the waiter would go, what's that? I said, we're getting away. And he's like, man, that is so cool. So that was our thing. We'd get away for that one bit and we'd just bring, forget life, forget life. And I think it's having a date night with your partner, your spouse. Uh, um, I'm thinking partner, spouse. I'm not even thinking about, you know, the singles that are running around there. <laughs> Well, this brings up a, a thing yeah. that I, I, I probably should have mentioned earlier, but I, I'm going to say right now, before you, in, before you introduce cannabis to your partnered sex, yeah. start with a date night for yourself. Because before you are in a situation, whether you're concerned, you know, hopefully you're not concerned about consent violations, but whether you are concerned about your ability to be present with a certain dosage or a certain strain or anything like that, uh, or, or you just want to make sure that it's the right vibe, 
take yourself on a date first and see how this particular preparation works for you. Good. And then you have that data, you're armed with that when you go uh, into a partnered situation. And that way there's less variables. Date night is such a great idea, both for yourself and with your partner. And if you can bring cannabis into that and heck, you know, share a joint and listen to some Pink Floyd together, jack the speaker in and just groove out together. And you can really connect at a, at a much deeper level, uh, even, even in this weird situation in fact you're too, i'm gonna you're, you're too young for pink floyd you're oh too... no i heard pink floyd in the cradle man oh, my, my, God. my dad used to play that for me oh, i grew boy. up with it oh boy yeah that that that, that uh yeah yeah, yeah. so that's... so yeah that's definitely uh, a good practice and a good self uh self care practice as well great great points so let's talk about date night by yourself date night with your, with your partner. There's so many different products out there. I mean, so many different products out there. Um, how do you, I mean, especially with the CBD market, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, you can go down, it, it, this is the thing that drives me nuts about, about uh, the media. You know, everyone thinks CBD is CBD is CBD. When I do go down to a gas station, buy my sex product or a CBD product, probably not. Um, where do you find a, a, a uh, are, are you blushing now? Am I seeing that? I'm always, I, I have rosacea, so it's really okay. hard to tell whether I'm blushing or just not taking care of my skin. Nope. Nope. Um, so how, so how does the, how, how does someone find, uh, a reliable product, you know, for this? Uh, I know there's store, I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area, so there are stores, um, that, publicly advertised on the radio and, and stuff like that. And I applaud them because I think it just breaks the ice. It's, it's, it's still taboo. People yeah. feel uncomfortable. I remember people the first time Corinne and I walked into a dispensary, you know, she just felt like, Oh, what am I doing? I'm doing something wrong. I'm walking into this location that has all this stuff called cannabis and I'm not supposed to be here because this is what I was brought up to, you know, to know. Um, and the same thing with, with couples I talk about, you know, go into a store, walk in there, look, point, giggle, chuckle, whatever, you know, but it break the ice. And so, mm -hmm. but when it comes to products in the cannabis industry, I know there are a handful, you have one. So I want you to, uh, talk about your, you, what you, what you're doing. Um, what, what should they look at? You know, um, mm -hmm. you know, I had, you know, I had someone who was embarrassed to, to buy one online, uh, buy some of these products online and they lived in the legal state. So they had their friend get it. And it's just, I don't want that coming to my house. And it's like, so what can you, what can you share about one couples that are, or, or individuals that are embarrassed to, to purchase it and have it sent to their house or what should they look out for? Yeah, th this is a really, uh, cruel and tragic. And I'm, again, I'm not exaggerating. I think sexuality yeah. is really central and really important uh, to life. So I, I don't think this is a minor issue at all. The fact that we have taken these, any, any products designed to enhance sex with, that have THC in them, have to, for regulatory reasons, by law, live in a cannabis specific store. And that's really inappropriate, actually, because the the people who work there didn't sign up to be sex educators and they're not trained as such. And the people who are going in there, you're, you don't want to ask for lube next to, you know, from somebody that looks like your grandpa and standing next to somebody that looks like your son. This is why we have sex specific stores because when you, when you go into one of these shops and thank goodness now we have a lot of good options. We have Babeland and um, Good Vibrations, which are now actually merged. Um, you have a lot of these great shops where the people that work there, you, you can comfortably ask them. They do this all day long. It's fine. You know, uh, whereas in a shop, you don't know who you're going to talk to in a pot shop. You don't know who you're going to talk to. And it's a, you're talking it's a, at a dispensary, right? At a dispensary. Yeah. Up in see up in Washington, we say pot shop, but pot shop. Well, yeah, I mean, but yeah. even down here, but that's the thing, even with, even with, uh, that's why, even with dispensaries, I always recommend you know, having a doctor involved for whatever product, because chances are whoever's in the dispensary, like you're saying, they're not a sex expert. They're not a cannabis expert. They don't know if you have diabetes and you're, or you're on other medications or you are taking Viagra. Uh, you know, there are drug to drug interactions. And so, um, but for what you're talking about, you know, 
the stores and, and, and obtaining obtaining uh, these sexual products. Um, yeah. You can talk to somebody that 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 knows about this, right? Well, I I wish that I could confidently give that advice. Actually, the problem is the chances of you finding a doctor that is educated in these two areas is very slim. There are you know four or five people uh, that are really specialists in this area, and uh, Dr. Tischler is one of them, which is how our paths came to cross. Uh, there there are very few people who are standing in the middle of this Venn diagram, and that's actually how I got started in the industry in the first place is I was intending on being a, a sex educator. That was my job. I was, I was going to do that. Uh, the, the, you know, I graduated into the recession in 2005. And so, you know, it was building that business and I was working at my friend's pot shop, you know, like that was, that was what I was doing. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and, and then I see these products come in and this is actually 2011. Um, uh, that have these terrible names and they contain ingredients like glycerin, which is food for the bad actors in the vaginal biome. They've got propylene glycol or other glycols, which are endocrine disruptors. And these are things that really don't belong in a vagina. And so I'm noticing that there's these people who know a lot about weed. And then there's people who know a lot about sex and sexual product development. And there's very few people who live in both of those worlds. And that's why I decided to step into that role. And there's a few other people who have done the same thing. So unfortunately, while I'd like to say, talk to your doctor, your doctor's not likely to be educated on both of these things. Um, talk to, you know, you can give me a call and I'll do a consultation or you can talk to Dr. Tischler. You can visit our uh, Sex and Cannabis Specialist Association, which is just sexandcannabis.com and you can get some basic knowledge there. Uh, and if you have any questions, you know, we're, we're happy to field them. The uh, what was I going? Oh, so how to, how to find the right products is really the, the overarching question here. And because of this lack of knowledge out there, this lack of education and the dual stigmatization, you are in a buyer beware yeah. position even more than people who are getting cannabis for, say, pain relief. You're really in this, this spot where you have to be hyper vigilant about what the ingredients are. You have to know what ingredients to avoid. And we do have an article on the sexandcannabis.com website where you can read what ingredients to avoid. Mm. And you have to also think about what your safer sex protocols are. If you are someone that is using any kind of barrier, whether it's latex, nitrile, polyisoprene, or even polyurethane, they used to say polyurethane was safe, but it, those are Trojan Supras. Uh, those are no longer considered safe with any oil-based preparation. This becomes a problem because cannabinoids are most often extracted into oil, right? Almost everything out there is going to be oil-based in one way or another. That can be fine if you're not using barriers. Um, there are some drawbacks, though, particularly for people with vaginas. You, you may find that oils don't work for you for any number of reasons. The type of oil that is used is relevant. You don't want an oil that has too high a wax content that can create areas for bacteria and yeast to thrive and lead to infections. Even cleaner oils are not compatible with some people's biome. Uh, some people find the smell off-putting, the cannabis herbaceous smell. Some people don't find pleasant in a sexy context. Uh, sometimes they don't like the staining. You know, you have nice lingerie. You don't want to have oil-based stuff staining. And so my business partner and I, and we have, again, I, I just split off to do my own consulting, uh, but uh, we founded this, this uh, company, Velvet Swing, to address those, those very problems because everything else out there was essentially oil-based and had these drawbacks. But our main concern, both coming from the sexual health advocacy and sex positivity worlds, was the barrier compatibility issue, right? Most people, muggles, I call them, people who don't live sex 24-7, um, most people just don't know that oil is not compatible with condoms. They just don't know that. And bud tenders don't know that, you know? So people are going into these shops and they're buying products that are, that are, uh, that are uh, compromising their safer sex methods. Uh, 
So when and, you say they're not, they're not compatible, what does it do? Does it break down the condom or? Yeah, it? it does. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it is about the, um, uh, oh my gosh, the, I, I think I'm, I've been doing so many <laughs> calls yeah, this yeah, morning. Yeah. Like I told you, I've been on so many <laughs> phone calls. Um, it is, yes, essentially. So you, you have, um, the polarity, that's the word I was looking for. Like the, the polarity of oil, uh, prevents the it, it gets in the way of the bonds of the latex basically okay. right so you're more likely to have breakage you can have degradation that compromises the integrity of the barrier without having breakage which is kind of your worst case scenario because then you've had a failure without a break you don't know it right yep yep uh and so these these just oil plus barriers of any kind. If you're going to use oil with a barrier, you can try it with polyurethane, which is tro tro Trojan Supras, but they have said, Trojan has said, they do not want to represent that as, as a safe choice. Basically, if oil, then no barrier. You need to choose a different method of birth control. This is for topicals, uh, which are, are a non-generally asterisk here. They are non-intoxicating for the vast majority of people, the vast majority of the time. So, so, are they, so um, you know, probably people, I, I have a lot of people blushing here. Are they edible? I mean, yes, mostly. Yeah. 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 Again, you wouldn't want to be ingesting some of the, the ones that are um, formulated poorly, but the idea that it's not intoxicating is just tied to that localized effect. If you're just using it on your genitals, let's say also works for areolas. Uh, but if you are trying to avoid intoxication, don't put it in your digestive tract. So don't use it anally and don't use it orally. Uh, if you get enough of it, then you can experience a, a psychoactive high. But generally speaking, the quantity that you're ingesting is small, right? You're not getting a whole lot of milligrams of THC, but it's completely possible. Uh, in general, vaginas are not designed to absorb things and put them in the bloodstream, but a little bit does happen. So, you know, maybe a milligram or two, maybe at most, right, would happen in, in regular intercourse. Uh, and uh, that's not a concern for the vast majority of people, but it can aggregate if you use a lot. And we got some fun stories from our test group about that. Right. <laughs> so, so yeah, that's for topicals. Um, for, for systemics, uh, which is any edible, any smokable, vapable thing, anything that's going to go through your bloodstream. Uh, and that, I guess, would include tinctures as well, although those are kind of straddling the line. So do you uh, have a whole product line or do no, you? Well, there's two products in Washington. Okay. Uh, Velvet Swing is the, the topical that we developed that is the first THC, the first THC water-based topical. So not, not available in all 50 states. So basically, if you're Absolutely it, not. You nope. have to be up in Washington. Or California. Um, our California distribution has decreased. Um, the, uh, the, the Sacramento area, the San Francisco area is the, kind of your best bet to get it there. Very well distributed. They have it at good vibrations? So that was the store I was talking about. No, nope, because it has THC. This is the problem. Oh, excuse me. That's what you're saying. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. You're, you're going into a, a dispensary. Yeah, yeah, you have you ca you have to, you right? Yeah. And uh you you can get these CBD versions, you can make it at home even and that's it's a pretty similar infusion process to making any other kind of infused oil, but uh then you're dealing with oil. So the the water-based thing is actually a very tricky complicated development process. Mm -hmm. We did a lot of work to ensure that it is not going to compromise barriers as that was our, our main thing, but it's not easy. And so finding a water-based version is difficult. And so we wanted to provide that if you're in Washington. Yeah. Um, Cause this, this is a question that again, just popped in my head right now. Does it come up, show up on a drug test? Yes. If uh, generally, no, if you have, if you have one, interaction with it? No, probably not. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, it's about how much, as long as you're not ingesting it, let's assume heterosexual. Well, you're talking rectally because it rectally comes up with suppositories yes. in, in the industry and a lot of pay, a lot of doctors, it's literally on the fence. We did an article is the posterior superior for rectal suppositories. Yeah. 
we got a lot of, I was going to say a lot of shit, but we did. We had a lot of people that got really pissed off at us to saying, there's no, it's impossible. It doesn't break the blood vein barrier and stuff like that. I've seen peace. I've seen it work on patients that are cancer patients. Yeah. And if something told me or my wife that eating a pen would work, you better believe I'm going to eat it. And mm-hmm. so I don't want to ever take any hope away from anybody that has an issue um, just because, and so that's why I was asking about that. Um, yeah. But, what you're doing. I, know I was at the hour and I apologize. So if you, if you want to, in closing, if we, we finish that, then we can do it in closing, but I do yeah. want you to plug your business. No, there's a couple. Well, I have, as I said, I have separated with them. My, my business now is Sabara Consulting, okay, cool, C-E-B-A-R-A. Cool. And you can uh, Google that and, uh, or you can go to chelseasabara.com. Uh, again, C-E-B-A-R-A is how my last name is spelled. And I am looking for work right now. So let me know if you want to collaborate. <laughs> Yay. Um, uh, and so, so yeah, rectally, quickly, rectally, uh, we're talking about dense vasculature here okay. in the rectum and anywhere else. So anywhere that you have that dense blood vessel, you're getting a little bit of absorption. Okay. Um, yeah. And so that, and, uh, and the only other thing that I just really like to say, I think we covered everything else is yeah. any time that you are using these topical products, uh, I want to try to discourage people thinking of them as lubes. People call them Weird. That was a wind gust. That was strange. Uh, people, they're, uh, marketing, they're called lubes a lot of times. And while they are slick and luby, I really want to drive home the point that you do not use them for lubrication. They are topicals. So this is something that you want to apply and allow to soak in. Give it time, ideally 20 to 40 minutes if you can wait that long. And you will have a much better effect. Um, again, topicals, not not lubes and you can use them for lubrication too later but if you're what if you're trying to enhance uh your sensation let it sit <laughs> maybe apply give that massage um, perfect you know and uh yep. what you're talking about and i and i and, and I, I go on with this but you're talking two things you're talking not the lube but but the the oil based to put down wait 20 to 40 minutes earlier in the conversation we were talking for enhancement um, you know, both physically, emotionally, spiritually, you're saying ingesting via smoking, tincture or edible that helps the body um, uh, with the CB, especially the brain with the CB1 receptor and, and CB2 receptors, you know, throughout, mm-hmm. throughout our bodies um, and bringing it in, in, in I, I want to say intensifying that uh, sexual experience uh, by yourself or with your partner. Yeah, absolutely. With that, you don't have to worry as much uh, if you're smoking or if you're vaping, but with it, when it comes to edibles, and again, I do try to discourage people from using edibles. They're sexy and they're cute and you, they seem like a natural fit, but because you don't know where you're at, then you get into this zone where it's so easy to overdo it. We all had that situation with that brownie in college, didn't we? You know, uh, and, and that plus sex is a bad scene because one of the things that can happen if you do have too much is you go nonverbal and that really makes it difficult to communicate with your partner so unless you're a pro at this i really say stay away from the edibles focus on light low dosage and topicals i think the two of them together is a great combo um, and uh and and you'll have a much better time Wait, Chelsea, I can't thank you enough can you give your 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 um new business to plug as well yeah, absolutely. It's Sabara Consulting. And uh, I'm focusing on any, anyone who, who wants to refine their products or branding, but I'm really uh, making a, a drive at folks who are new to the cannabis industry, who maybe are unfamiliar with formulating with cannabinoids. So product development, uh, any kind of brand refinement, or uh, even content. I'm doing a little bit of content work right now. You can come to Chelsea Sabara, C-H-E-L-S-E-A, C-E-B-A-R-A.com and drop me a line and uh, let me know what uh, you'd like to do together. Great. Thank you so much. And, and, and are you into phone numbers nowadays too, or you want to just have them contact you? Immediately? Just shoot me an email. Yeah. I would get a whole bunch of stuff if, you know, I put yeah, my phone down. Thousands and thousands. <laughs> it, it never ends here too. So uh, Chelsea Sabar, I thank you so much for being on and having this conversation uh, with me and, and our, and our followers. Uh, I think we'll, we'll, we have a few blushes for the first time on the <laughs> show here too. So, but I thank you. And uh, 
Um, and thank you for our listeners for, you know, this is a topic that, that comes up quite a bit. Sometimes it's taboo for some other times, you know, people just want to learn and lo- know and don't, and the, it's not a, it's not illegal to ask a question about sex or cannabis. Um, um, but again, there's not to replace uh, a one-on-one with your doctor, your counselor, but I uh, hope this in, 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 in helps you with your life as well. And so uh, John Malanka, blushing with the United Pay with the United Patients Group, be informed and be well, and we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, John Malanka here with the United Patients Group. I hope you've enjoyed our videos. Please click like as well as subscribe to our channel here on YouTube. Also follow us on Twitter at U Patients Group and on Facebook at United Patients Group, as well as for our podcast. Please click the link in the description below. We'll see you there. Bye-bye.